Yeah. I think it's very well known that in the past there was a big machloket disagreement about what type of world we live in. Is the world flat or is it a sphere or is it a circle? That's a very classic old machloket. Unfortunately, it seems to be that there's some people that still believe that we live in the flat world. But okay, those are all the people who everything in this world is one big conspiracy anyways. But that, most people agreed, was a circular world. That wasn't so much a chidush that occurred afterwards. Whenever you look at a horizon, you see it going behind the horizon in a type of circular type of phenomenon. It, goes, it doesn't go into the ocean, it goes behind the ocean, so to speak. Whenever you see an eclipse, you're able to see the shadow of the earth that goes in between the moon and the sun that also has obviously a spherical type of phenomenon and that's why that's something that's well accepted. Copernicus, as we all know, who lived in 1543, was Mechadesh. He came up with an incredible idea which was known as the heliocentric universe. His chiddush, his novelty of course, was that the earth is not in the center of the universe, but the sun is in the center of the universe, which was wow, a whopper dopper chiddush, nothing to do with Aristotle. Aristotle was very strong that we are the world, therefore we are in the center, and the earth is sitting in the center, the, the, and therefore the moon and the earth and the sun and all the other planets go around the earth who is sitting in the center of all the planets. That's what it was. That's what, now what, how, what was his proof, and how did he seem to pull off this raya. Very straightforward, nice understanding. Basically, if you say that we, the Earth, are in the center of the universe, and the sun goes around us, is going around us, so we all know that the sun is 93 million miles away. A hop, skip, and a jump. 93 million miles away, the sun is from us. That means the radius of the Earth to the sun is 93 million miles. So if you want to know the circumference, meaning the circular amount of space that it takes the sun to go around the Earth if we are in the center, of course we use the ever popular 2 pi r, which I'm sure we're also familiar with. Some of us have trauma when I mention the, the theorem in the first place. Anyways, 2 pi r, we do the radius times pi, double, and double it, as we all are familiar with. According to that, it comes out that the circumference of the sun going around the earth would be 584 million miles in one day. Of course, we're talking about one day. How long does it take the sun to go around the earth in one day, obviously? So in one day, 24 hours, it would have to travel 584 million miles. And you're complaining about your trips. Eventually, you go and take that math mathematically and figure, so that means how fast does the sun have to travel to get there. So obviously, you divide those 500 and uh, 84 million miles into, into 16, you get 24 million miles per hour. Okay, you end up getting 24 million miles per hour. And if you take it down to the minutes, it comes out approximately 400,000 miles per minute. Kind of like your teenager drives when he takes your Tesla out for a drive. 400,000 miles per minute. That's pretty fast. So, Seder, we could swallow that one. Akash Baruch Hu does a lot of fancy things. 400,000 miles per second. We'll go with it. However, the problem is when you get to the stars. The stars also go in a perfect circular motion around the Earth, as we all are familiar with. And they go, but the circumference of the stars are 60 times more than that. By the way, 400,000 miles per minute. Anyways, the, the stars, when they go around, they are 60 times the circumference more than the sun. So if that would be true, it would mean that the... Obviously, if it was 400,000 miles per minute by the sun, and if the circumference of the stars are 60 times plus more than 60 times, so it means that they would have to go 400,000 miles per second. In one second, go 400,000 miles per second. That is mathematically and physically not possible. That is known as the speed of light, which of course is 186,262 miles per second. That's the speed of light. This would be double the speed of light, which every scientist in the book says is not physically possible. You can never get there. Einstein mathematically proved this, that you cannot go the speed of light. If you would, you'd go back in time. 
That's the whole idea of the time-space scenario. It can't happen, and therefore it's impossible to say the stars are going 400,000 miles per second around the Earth, A. And B, even if you say they are going 400,000 miles per second, which is faster than the speed of light, so you would not be able to see the stars because they're going beyond the speed of light. So obviously the light that comes from the stars would be beyond, and you wouldn't be able to see them. Pretty nifty, huh? So that more or less is what Copernicus was coming to prove, so it must be, as I'm sure we're all so familiar with, come on, I'm speaking English, I hope everybody knows what I'm talking about, at least you went to your science fair projects when you were in 7th or 8th grade, that the sun is in the middle, and the earth is the third planet off, and a day doesn't come from a full sibuv, a full spin around the sun, rather it comes from the earth itself spinning like a top just like it spins like a sevivon, and therefore a day can happen by us spinning, that's not such a big deal. I, how long does it take to go out on the sun? Okay, so that takes 365 days, no problem. That doesn't destroy this whole theory about how fast we have to be traveling. It takes 364 days in order till we make a full turn around, a full turn around the sun. Of course, the tilt, which is, which is in the earth, of course, is the reason why we have seasons, because at one point, the upper, the, uh, upper a a a hemisphere of the world is closer to the sun, and, and that, therefore that is the, uh, that's the time of the, the summer, as opposed to the winter is the part that's far away, and then it switches halfway around the year, which we should be also familiar with. So far, so good, right? This is Mephorsa Zohar, believe it. It says in Vayikra, listen to these words. Kol sova yidgagel, kol, kol uh, olam midgalgela be'igula kekadur. The world goes around like a circle, like a top, just like a ball that turns around, mamash, like the dry manal, and of course we know the Zohar was written over 2,000 years ago, when it comes to the Kabbalah. Anyways, that's the idea. Now, Copernicus, you would have thought, okay, at least he should have had his claim to fame by coming up with such a beautiful, fantastic theory, phenomenon, probably a truth, we could say, as an axiom. However... The church, of course, wanted his throat for doing this, because anyone who is machish, who argues with Aristotle, or tries to disagree with him, off with his head. Al-Kirikach, there was one person who stuck to his guns very strongly, a person by the name of Bruno, some Italian scientist, and he was put to the guillotine. That's right, you don't mess with the church, at least in the 1500s. So Copernicus knew what he was knew what he was up against, especially since Copernicus himself was a cleric, and therefore he shut his mouth. Something we recommend sometimes in Shalom Bayit. But anyways, that's what he decided to do, and therefore he died to the grave with this beautiful theory, which people knew about. It became somewhat popular, but never realizing that it will ever ever reach any type of potential. Soon afterwards, a person by the name of Galileo also came around, as we might be familiar with, and he also in the 1600s was proving this theory very strongly, and he was held in house arrest till he died. That's it. That's it. They, they knew how to take care of people the way it was supposed to be. Well, why we should deal with the terrorists the way the church used to deal with us. Anyway, so that's how you were able to take care of, uh, of this problem. Now, the biggest uh, problem, one of the problems that they had, let's say, the church or the Aristotelian type of phenomenon is, if we're really spinning like a top, it doesn't sort of feel like it, I'm not getting dizzy, you know, I get dizzy every time I go on one of those rides, that, those circle rides in Disneyland, you go around there, I'm about to throw up, and here I am going on, I'm sitting on the planet going in a big spin, and I don't feel any, any type of nauseousness, I don't feel sick at all. So what's the pshat? Obviously, you can't feel it. That's A. And B, you know, if I throw a ball up, it lands back in my glove, in my hand. It comes right back to me. Why doesn't it go behind me? If we're spinning, then when I throw it up, it should go behind. It should fall behind me. So that's why the church was very much of the opinion that it can't be that we are spinning, we are sitting in the center of the universe, not moving, and everything else is moving around us. Just like the church themselves felt, that everything moves around what they decide. Anyways, the answer to this question, of course, Newton was able to take care of with his theory of gravity, which I'm sure we all have heard of that one, in 1687, because it's not just proving that gravity can make an apple fall on my head, but it does a lot more than that because he explained how the gravitational pull is able to keep things going in a perfect circle. In which case, that if the Earth, the little Earth was in the center, it would never be able to pull a massive sun, which is a couple million times bigger than it, or 
around it in a circular phenomenon. Only something as large as the sun, which is much bigger than all the planets, the other nine or eight planets that we have around us, that's because of its great gravitational pull, therefore the other planets are able to do it, and there it must be that the sun is in the center, pulling everybody else around his rope, flowing, playing, playing jump rope around him because of his greatness. Earth would never be able to accomplish such a strong gravitational pull, so it must be, as we are familiar with, that we are the third planet, which the number three has a lot to do in Kabbalah, and there's a reason why we're the third planet. Lo Achshav, not for now. Anyways, that is this whole theory. You guys are probably wondering, what is this guy doing? Did I get onto Torah anytime? Did I get into science anytime? What happened over here? So this is incredibly relevant for Parshas Noach and Parshas Bracious. And I'm going to explain to you why. Because the Pasuk says in Parshas Noach, like this, Od kol yemei Hashem promised after Noach comes out of the ark that I will not stop any more any winter and summer or heat and cold, autumn and fall. And listen to this, Veryom Velayla Lo Yishbotu. And also day and night will not stop. I will make sure that day and night stays continuous. What is this Pasuk telling us in Perik Chet Pasuk Chavbet? It's telling us that during the Mabul there was a complete stoppage of time. Yom Velayla Yishbotu. During that whole year there was no time. As Rashi points out, the whole entire Mabel, the whole entire time of the Mabel, which of course we know was a full year, there was no day and night, it all stayed stand at a stagnant point, stand without moving at all. Now this always bothered me. I had a tremendous kasha on this, and Baruch Hashem afterwards I found the Re'em, Rav Leil's Mizrahi, and the Siftei Chachamim brings it, asked this very simple question. How can it be if everything stayed at a standstill, if there was a stagnant universe and, and no moon and no stars, everything was just staying day and day, day was day and day was night, and night was night, and nothing moved. How did you figure out that it took a year to get here? How do you know that the marble took a full year? There was no day and night in the first place. How is that possible? That's... A, and B, if you, for those of us who've been through Chumash with Rashi, we know that Rashi gets very calculated on the days. It was 40 days of rain, 150 days where the water was going up, and then it started receding, until it got to the final account of the 350 days. It was very specific in the amount of days. Lila beyond, there was no Lila, there was no day and night. How'd you get away with such a thing? It can't be. So many of the Mepharshim actually discuss this idea, the Sefer Akeda says that he himself, Noach, if he wasn't busy enough, he was counting the days. He counted, one, two, three, he was counting, he was counting the time. How do you do it exactly without a watch? It's very hard. That's why there are other Terutzim, based on a Breshis Rabbah, that said, that believe it or not, listen to this, there was a Kli, had a special Kli to, that it was able to show him the differences in time. In the Breshis Rabbi in Lamed it says it was Evan Tova, which had a special Zgula, that was Megala this man, you know, like those, bu- those watches that you push the button and you're able to see the time? That's what he had. Noach had a watch, believe it or not. You think it was this invention by Psycho? Happened way before in Casio. He already had it back then. He had some Evan Tova that was able to tell him the time. He was able to keep up to know when to feed every animal, how to know when to start opening up the ark, when to start setting up birds, and everything like that. Obviously, it came through there. There's another Gemara, which we know in Brachot, in the beginning of Brachot, of Gimel, which says that there are different, at nighttime, there are different time periods. In the beginning of the night, there's a chamor, the donkey neighs. At the end of the night, there's the, the dogs. There's different time periods. So, the, so one of the answers that they say is maybe whenever you heard the donkey neigh, oh, the day passed, it's Shkia. Whenever you hear the donkey knows, or similar on a similar note, similar terrace, they say, come on, anoten lesachvivina, we say every day that a Kodesh Baruch Hu gives intelligence to a rooster. He doesn't need the night or day. He knows who you're there. He knows what, just when to do the cockadoodle do. And the sachvi, the, the, the rooster knew exactly when to go ahead and say, Pukat! to be able to know, to be able to tell him that it's a new and bright day early in the morning. So Baruch Hashem, Noach had the animals in his teva in order to keep time for him, to be able to point out to him when and where was the appropriate time to do this. <coughs> but I do want to point out one important thing. We see from here an incredible Yisodah, and from this I'm bringing you one idea, and from here we'll see a Musar idea. And when that will finish, 
something Rav Elchanan Wasserman asks in the beginning of Pesachim. He asks that how can it be, uh, he asks this question, is Zman, time, we're discussing time today, right? Is time what we call a simon or a siba? Is time something that is intrinsic, meaning it's always going no matter what, nothing makes it stop? It is not dependent on the moon and the stars, it is not dependent on the sun sh- going down and up, or that, it's, it's intrinsic, it lies in the Bria, and it's never changing. That's what we mean, that the Everything that we see, let's say you have to see three stars to know Shabbat is out, that's just a sign. That just tells me what time it is. That just tells me now, now it's the time when it's supposed to be like that. Or is it Siba, uh, meaning the reason why time changes is because the sun went down. When the sun goes down, then the time changes. But if the sun never goes down, then you'll never have the end of the day. It still stays up all the time. And the same thing with the, with the, night, with the nightfall. If you never ever get those three stars for whatever reason, let's say you can't get three stars, so nightfall never actually occurs. That is Chakira. And the truth is, both seem to have some type of connection. Because Lamaisa we see, um, uh, Lamaisa we see like this, that first of all, <coughs> we see that the Me'orot, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sun and the moon were created on Yom Ravi, on Wednesday, on the fourth day, even though we know the first three days, what does it say? Vayi Er, Vayi Boker, Yom Echad, V'yi Boker, Yom Sheni, V'yi Erev, V'yi Boker, Yom Shlishi. It seems to be that there was still Erev Boker, meaning that there was still time going on, even before he was actually able to get there. He, even, though, even though he was actually, we had any, so it sounds like the sun and moon are not what makes this, the time dependent. It seems to be that it works divorced from the time of the moon. It's intrinsic in the Bria. Hashem put time into the Bria and it's never, it never stops. It just keeps going. There was a Misa that happened once, and a true Misa, believe it or not, that a woman had a new uh, house, had someone to help out, a maid in the house, the housekeeper in the house, to take care of the, of the things. But she noticed this woman wasn't exactly 100%. She was an interesting lady, but said she was cleaning the house. Kids, after a little time, the woman, go, the, the housekeeper comes up to the balata bait, she comes to the, to the wife of the house, and she says, okay, it's time to go, it's already 4 o'clock, I've been here 3 hours, can you please pay me, I have to run, they're waiting for me at home. So the lady looked at the clock, she goes, wow, okay, wow, I guess time flies when you're having fun, and she paid her her money, and she left. Later that night, when her husband came late, and this, and she realized, she suddenly started checking out and saying, something's wrong here. She noticed that the clock was fast an hour and a half. Why was it fast an hour and a half? She realized that this lady moved the hands of the clock, she turned the hands of the clock, to make it forward an hour and a half so that she would work an hour and a half and get paid for a three-hour job. She ended up doing something with a certain chachma. Trust me, she didn't come back next week. It's a true story. I don't know what she thinks she was going to accomplish from that, but she didn't get back, she didn't come back next week. But the question is, one second, what did she do wrong? The clock said 4 o'clock, so it must be it was 4 o'clock. But we all know that's not true. Time is something behind the clock. The clock is there only as a siman. It's there to teach me something. It's not to tell me something that that is the time. It's just there as a medium to be able to figure out what time it is. But the time is above. So that's how we're understanding this side over here. That's the way to understand this side over here of Rav Hanan. The time always flows. It goes, it goes, it goes. That's all. We use vehicles like a sundial or a clock or a watch or these things in order to figure out what time it is. Or sometimes we look at the three stars or the moon going up and the sun. That, that's what we do to figure out time. But the time never is changing. As opposed to the other position is to say that time does change because it depends on the elements around us. As the Pasuk says, Lahavdil, why did Hashem create, as we say in Perseva Breshit, why did Hashem create the moon and the sun and the stars? This is the way you're going to have a year, this is the way you're going to have a day, this is the way that you should know the difference between night and day. This is what is Gorem, what causes time to occur. It sounds like through this, that's what causes the time to occur. So if I stop the sun, so to speak, so I can stop time, we all are familiar with the idea that Einstein, as I mentioned before, brought up as being able, what we call space-time. And that is that if we go a certain 
uh, speed, you are actually able to play around with time. You can actually go back in time, the Fountain of Youth. You're able to go back and make yourself younger. We've had plenty of movies that have been around for the past 60 years since this theory of Einstein about going back in time. Because we've always found this tremendous phenomenon about the fact that time is somewhat relative. Time is automatic, but it's something that can be played with. Okay, so that is this idea of time. What do we see, you know, coming back to Noah? Time stopped. Yes or no? No. We said the Bible was around for a full year. 365 days, look at Rashi's. 150, 150 days here, 40 days here. Time was moving. But the elements, all the me'orot, the sun and the moon and all the, all the constellations were at a standstill. We see clear as day, pardon the expression, clear as day that even though the constellations might be at a standstill, time still is able to move. Time still moves because it's bad, it's intrinsic, it's always moving. It's on the roll, it's on the way to get to the place that it needs to get there. And therefore it can't be stopped. Another example. We know by Yaakov Avinu that he got to a certain place, the, the Midrash says in Breshid Rabbah, and the sun went down, boom, because he wanted him to sleep in that spot. Kiba Shemesh, the Shemesh came down early. The Midrash says an incredible thing, it says, but what are we going to do? Two hours early, the sun went down, did an absolute miracle. We have to make up for these two hours. The Midrash figures it out, and it says, okay, on the way back, when Yaakov Avinu was on his way back to his father, to see his father, and he was leaving Lavan, over there it says, Ki It went up two hours early. Oh, we made up for the lost time. Don't worry, it's a cold besed there. The two hours that we lost before, it's okay, we still have two more hours, and we made it up. Excuse me, understand, if the sun went down, it went down, so besed, it'll just keep going, life goes on without it. Now it's a big deal, so you lost those two, it's not such a big deal, the, the cycle continues. But the answer is, time is automatic, as we mentioned before, based on the Copernicus theory, that things are always moving, things are always going, and even if you end up slowing things down, it doesn't matter because time is intrinsic. Time is not bound to the fact that things have to be going in this circular type of uh, this, uh, this, this circular type of motion to be able to get it. One last example of this, we're going to finish with Yeshua. There's no more popular story than in Yeshua and Perik Yud. We spoke about this in Sefer Yeshua. It's Kedai, those Tanakh Shirem, in my opinion, are very chashuv. In Perik Yud and Yeshua, we spoke over there in detail about the concept that we're speaking about now of time. And over there we all know that V'yamod HaShemesh Dom, the Shemesh was quiet. He stopped moving. Yeshua wanted to finish up the war as quick as possible. So therefore, Kodesh Baruch Hu said, I'm going to stop the day, and he let him finish in order that they couldn't get away. He didn't let night fall, and he kept it up. And all this farm, the Malbim, the al the Akeda, all say this chiluk. They say the, the Shemesh Ahmad, the sun stopped, meaning the twirling of the earth stopped, when the day, 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 day stopped. That twir turning like a top of the earth stopped. But the continuation around the sun kept going. That did not come at a standstill. That kept going. Just like by Yaakov Avinu, it stopped. The turning of the earth stopped. But the continuation kept going. Why did it keep going? Because they said if you didn't, then you'd have to leave the sun like that for a year in order that the earth should get back to the same place again. We'd have to wait a full year in order for it to get back to the same place. Why? Because we have to be... Uh, we have to get things in sync. Things have to come in the same spot. We have to, everything has to be aligned. And if we stop the earth from turning, let's say, for a full day, or that's what it was, a full day of 24 hours, according to the Shita, so then it would be out of sync, it would be off a day, it would be a little bit more farther down in the sun, and everything would be not uh, aligned. If it, if, it, if it would have been left in the same place, it would have, been, it would have had to make up for it. So instead, he says that really the earth kept going, and we didn't have to wait a full second, the earth kept moving around the sun, even though the actual turning on its axis stopped. He compares it kind of like, you ever see those water mills where they pick up water and it keeps it up and goes down? So he says it's much harder to stop it when it's in the process of moving, and you have to hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. So that was the big nest in order to make it stop. I'm just pointing out from here also the same phenomenon that we see time is automatic. You can't just stop time by stopping the elements outside, stopping the things outside. Time is there, time is always around, and time cannot be 
played around with, even by that housekeeper. It can't be messed around with. And from here we hear one beautiful Musa lesson, which I want to finish with, and I think we should see and understand that time is oh so precious. There's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. The gray, be- the gray hairs are coming in. We know that time is there and advancing constantly. The Gemara in Chagiga says that a shota, who's someone who's a fool? Someone who loses something that's given to him. If he's given a rock and he keeps it, and he's given money, and he throws it, so he knows something's wrong with him. Or he's a, a katan, we say he's a child, or he's a shota, or he's a fool. So too, if someone puts in your bank account every day $1,440, every day you get in your bank account $1,440, but when when it cuts 12 o'clock and they turn into a pumpkin, all the, all the money in the bank disappears. What would a normal human being do? He'd immediately pull out the $1,440 and go ahead and invest it, go ahead and buy stuff with it, or put it in cash. He'll do something with it. I would never leave it there knowing that at 12 o'clock it disappears, right? I think we all understand that. Every day you are given 1,440 minutes. 1,440 minutes. Shote me'abed ma'shanoitnimo, as the Chofetz Chaim used to say. Someone who wastes his time is not not from, it's not that he's not religious, he's just stupid. He's foolish. That's the word of the Chofetz Chaim. Someone who wastes time, he says, is just someone who doesn't realize you're just you're destroying yourself. I always say when those people use that expression, I want to kill time, it's literally the proper word. To kill time is literally ritzicha. You're over on the iser of killing someone else. Because killing time, time is life. Time is blood. Time is limited. And we know that we're not here forever. So a person has to go ahead and take advantage of every minute. As we understand, I think there's a famous marshal about the person who was sitting on a train and he was very bored. So while he was on the train, he was throwing out dollar bills, dollar bills during the whole time out the window. Until when he finally reached his destination, he realized he had no more money on him, and he went to go borrow money from someone who said, no way, you're crazy. Same thing when you're sitting on a train, or you're sitting on a plane, or you're sitting on some type of transport where you're able to do it. Instead of going and swiping and looking and looking on your phone, Get out a safer, okay, I understand, on the phone you could do the same thing also, and start learning. Take advantage of the time. If you're waiting for someone, why not take advantage? You should always have a chumash in your pocket for when you're at a wedding and there's a lot of dead time, as we're very familiar with, pardon the expression. So you go ahead and take advantage. I'm talking about books and people are looking at me like crazy, talking about little books and things like that. I understand you can have it on your phone, but you know there's something more beautiful about being connected to the Sefer itself. Rav Shach, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein one time brought to Rav Shach a, a Gemara with a magnifying glass, because Rav Shach reached 102, but he was almost blind basically in his last years, and he wasn't able to see anything towards the later part of his life. So he brought him this Gemara that you stick underneath a big magnifying glass, really a technologically advanced <laughs> magnifying glass, and the words are much bigger, and he said, oh, you can use this. So Rav Shach told Rav Moshe, he said, a Gemara that I can't smoosh, that I can't kiss, is Nishkin Gemara, that's not a Gemara for me. I need to be able to hold the Gemara, feel it, touch it. I have a feeling he wouldn't be learning Gemara on an iPhone. I don't know, you have to ask him. But I'll call him. I'm just saying that we see from here the idea of time, the creation of time, the beauty of time. It's a thing that's it's always moving, it's always moving. We saw it by Noah, we saw it by Yaakov Avinu when he ended up losing that time period, and we saw it by Yeshua, Shemesh Begivan Dom, and Copernicus is telling us that yes, time is here, and time is there to stay, it's going around and around and around, chaperine, and don't lose the opportunity. Shabbat Shalom.